Hi, and welcome to another fabulous episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, a podcast dedicated to helping you live a thyroid healthy lifestyle. We're so glad to be back with you again. I'm Dana Bowman. And I'm Ginny Maher, and we are the dynamic duo behind Thyroid Refresh and Thyroid 30. We have been so excited for this show, you guys. We are here today with the Dr. Jolene Brighton to talk about all things beyond the pill and thyroid. So welcome, Dr. Brighton. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me. Before we jump in and get to this amazing show, I want to tell everybody a little bit about Dr. Brighton. For those of you don't, that don't know, she's an NMD. And she's one of the leading experts in women's medicine and is a pioneer in her exploration of the far-reaching impact of hormonal birth control and the little-known side effects that impact health in a large way. Yes, she is. In her best-selling book, Beyond the Pill, she shares her clinical protocols aimed at supporting women struggling with symptoms of hormonal imbalance, including post-birth control pill syndrome and birth control-related side effects. A trained nutritional biochemist, and naturopathic physician, Dr. Brighton is the founder and clinic director at Rubus Health and an integrated women's health uh, medical clinic. And she's the member of Mind Body Green Collective and has been featured in prominent media outlets such as Forbes, Cosmopolitan, ABC News, and the New York Post. She is an amazing woman, amazing person. She's one of my favorites and we're so glad to have you with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> So let's talk about Beyond the Pill because this book has made a huge splash. I mean, I know I've heard it mentioned among friends, by our online community, more times than I can even count. So what's the driving force and message behind this best-selling book? Well, I wrote Beyond the Pill because I wanted to give women other options beyond birth control. So, you know, the pill has been an amazing uh, innovation in medicine and hormonal contraception altogether because, I mean, with that introduction came higher graduation rates and um, higher pay. Like, we get paid more now. We're the CEO of companies. Like, we're doing so many amazing things. And yet, the evolution of hormonal birth control has become a one-size-fits-all fix to any female issue. And I call it the pill for any female ill. Now, if you want to use birth control to suppress your symptoms, that's 100% your right to do that. But I wanted to offer women, what are other things that could be going on that maybe your doctor should be investigating? And so... Within the book, you'll learn like, you know, what do these period problems mean? Or what do these symptoms actually mean? What lab tests should you discuss with your doctor? Like, when is it time to go to your doctor? And what data can you be collecting to help you get those answers? And I wanted to support women on birth control as well. I did it for 10 years myself. There's so much in that book that I'm like, this is what I wish I would have known as for the 10 years I was on the pill and not necessarily be told, you know, just get off of it. Because for me as a first generation college student and the first woman in my family not to get pregnant before my 20s, like this was a really important tool for me to use. Now, I also called it Beyond the Pill because it's about going beyond the pill. Like when you get off of it, there is life after birth control. And there's a lot of women who are fearful to come off of birth control because their acne may be coming back or their painful periods may be coming back. But they also know that like they can't just stay on birth control for the rest of their life. And so really, you know, I designed this book to help women create their own user manual to understand their body their hormones. And as I looked at, now I own a lot of books. Um, I actually need to clean my books out. Um, but I own a lot of books and there are a lot of hormonal books out there, but it tends to be, here's how to heal your hormones naturally, or here's bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, or there's, here's hormone replacement therapy in general, or there were books, um, you know, about birth control, but they didn't include protocols. They were just like, here's a problem. Here's a problem. Here's a, I hate when I'm reading a book personally, when it's like problem, problem, problem. And I'm like, what is the solution? Oh, help. In Beyond the Pill, it's like, I present a problem, right away solution. It's very grat gratifying. You're like, oh, okay. Instant gratification with that. But what I noticed was, is there was no real like book out there about 
women's hormones, being on birth control, being off of birth control, and really covering this really important part of women's health. And so the book is for every woman uh, who wants to understand their hormones and not just sex hormones, but like thyroid and adrenals and gut health and liver health and what's up with your mood and your fertility and your libido and all of these things. And you know, there's information as well about birth control so that you can understand how this might be impacting your health. Is this the best decision for you to go on birth control? What can you monitor to understand that? And how do you get off when you're ready? And maybe you want to have a baby or maybe you don't. And so the book really is about supporting women in giving them the information they need to make the best decision for themselves and to know how to communicate with their doctor and to know how to take care of their body. There's so much to healing that never happens in the doctor's office. In fact, the majority of healing, I would argue, isn't taking place in a doctor's office. It's taking place at home, the choices you make in the grocery store, the choices you make, uh, whether you engage or not engage with somebody who is being inflammatory and aggressive. Like These different factors are really, really important in health. And I feel like it's been hugely disempowering and almost, you know, dismissive of uh, women to act like the only way that they can heal is to shut down their entire reproductive system. Hmm. 150% agree with you. And I'm disappointed that that is advice that they are given too yeah, well, frequently. I mean, I mean yeah, without another fair. side to it, you know, like totally. here's all the options. Yeah, but I mean, if your doctor is taught that birth control will fix just about any female problem that you have and is super easy as placing an IUD or popping a pill every day or inserting a ring, like things like that, why wouldn't they give it to you? The Uh trouble is, is that we're being told as women that one, we should just shut our mouths and say thank you and take our medication and not advocate for more research to be done. I mean, It blows my mind how long birth control has been around, how 100 million women are taking hormonal birth control worldwide, and how few studies we even have on brain health, let alone long-term brain health. I mean, it's things like this that I'll hear doctors say, well, there's no evidence to support that. Okay, but lack of evidence doesn't mean there isn't evidence. It just means we haven't asked the question which is a huge problem. And we see women out there telling their stories about their experience with birth control or they're just their experience with period problems. And we see people coming in and saying, you shouldn't talk about that. I'm like, you know what? It's 2019. Don't tell her what to do with her words and her story. Like done, shut it down. But the other thing is that you know, people get, I think, really afraid. I think this is very fear-based where doctors um, and, you know, clinics, places that dispense birth control, they're aware of the time when, you know, we didn't have access to this and they don't want to see that happen. They also don't want to see women who maybe need birth control because they have severe endometriosis or they have a a bleeding disorder, not take this medication because they're hearing about this other woman's story and the side effect. To that I say, Women are not stupid, so stop acting like they are. And for every woman, and when I teach you to do them beyond the pill as well, it's just ask, is this true for me? There is no one size fits all with birth control. Not everybody has the same response. And whether, whether or not she's telling the truth is not the question. The question is, why is that her experience, but it's not her experience? Like, what are these differences? And that's really where we need to get to. Stop silencing women's voices start listening to what they're saying. And this is how we do, how do we know what to ask in research? By listening to what people are saying. Like if women are saying that they're experiencing depression at a really high rate, why is it that we had to wait till 2016 to have this giant study when women have been complaining this since the introduction of birth control? And now there are people out there arguing, well, correlation's not causation, therefore birth control can't be involved in this. No, okay, it can be involved in this and we're not at a place to have causation studies and we can admit that, but what is going on here? What's the common theme? Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people in our audience who either have been on birth control or are currently on it. And I'm curious um, about, has there been much research done on how hormonal birth control can affect a woman's thyroid health? Well, that was a big eye opener for me when I got into that. So I actually, I have Hashimoto's. I'm hypothyroid. I am, you know, as soon as we get in this conversation, I think a a very quick way for people to dismiss me and not listen to the inconvenient things that I'm saying. And listen, like, do you think I want to be talking about this stuff knowing I did a decade on it? Like it's, it's not about that. It's not about what's convenient. It's about like the reality of the current state of medicine and how we save our, our sisters. And so, you know, in that, 
whenever people are like, well, you're just anti-pharmaceuticals. I'm like, yeah. And then this hypocrite pops a thyroid medication every single day. No, I'm not anti-pharmaceuticals at all. I'm really grateful that we have them. And I'm really grateful that we do have access to hormonal birth control. Now, when it comes to thyroid health, it's very interesting that um, not you haven't seen. I haven't seen any research or anything really put it all together. And I've had a lot of doctors reach out to me and say, "I came across your article. I read it in Beyond the Pill because there's an entire chapter on thyroid health. This is the first time I've ever seen all this information put together." So. With hormonal birth control, it leads, uh, the pill specifically, it leads to nutrient deficiencies, things like vitamin A, zinc, selenium, magnesium, B vitamins, things we need to make thyroid hormone, convert thyroid hormone, and use it at the cellular level. Now, the thing that's interesting that we don't know is what is going on in the brain. So for everybody listening, birth control works by impacting your brain. So let that sink in because we're all told that it's just in this little compartment of female reproductive health and that's the only thing it impacts. But the mechanism of action is to get your brain to stop talking to your ovaries in order to stop ovulation. Now, that doesn't always happen with progestin-based IUDs, but they definitely have their own issues. So with that, we actually don't know if we're taking these hormones and it impacts FSH and LH secretion from the pituitary. Well, that's also where TSH comes from. What's going on? Like, is there anything to that? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. We don't have enough research to know right now. So for everyone listening, TSH, brain hormone, tells your thyroid at the uh, you know base of your neck, make T4 and a little bit of T3. T4, inactive. T3, that's the mood metabolism nensies. By the way, if you're having irregular periods, long periods, uh, like periods that don't quit, your cycles are really long, things are getting wonky, thyroid is something that needs to be investigated. Birth control will mask a thyroid issue if all you're looking at is period problems. You will have a medication induced withdrawal bleed. You will have a pseudo period and that may go overlooked, but birth control cannot fix the thyroid disorder. And that's really important for women to understand. This can lead to infertility, but also heart disease. So definitely want to get it checked out. Now, with that T4, T3, we depend on our liver and our gut to actually convert T4 to T3, that active hormone. Your liver and your gut both take a hit while you're on hormonal birth control, which is why there's a chapter in the book. It's it's actually called Birth Control Detox 101. The chapter was called Liver Chapter. My awesome publishers know that I'm boring like that. And they were like, call it something (laughs) different. Like, let's, and I was like, okay. Let's go through birth control detox 101. Now, the reason why I called it that is because that chapter is about teaching you how your body naturally detoxifies your hormones and synthetic hormones. However, it's one of those things that in writing a book, in retrospect, I really would have done it differently. Like maybe named it something differently because people now have taken that, even some supplement companies, and said, you can't detox these hormones out. They stay in your system forever unless you do X, Y, and Z wrong. You're like, my book is about supporting your body and what it does naturally, not reinforcing that you're broken unless you have X, Y, and Z. Okay. That's old story. We need to move away from that. So in that, your liver takes a hit, your gut takes a hit. So these conversion sites may be struggling, but even if you do convert it to T3, there's this interesting phenomenon where thyroid binding globulin is elevated. So we see uh, hormone binding globulins go up. This is how in the research, I've actually had doctors say, oh, you know, that thyroid binding globulin thing, that's not really a thing. That sex hormone binding globulin thing, not really a thing. I'm like, hmm. If they want to know if you're really taking birth control, they can measure these binding proteins and they will be elevated. So when they're doing a trial and they think you're lying, they're, they're like, she's not taking it. She's not taking it. We can measure binding proteins. So thyroid binding globulin is exactly what it sounds like. It grabs on to your free hormone. What you use is free thyroid hormone, not total thyroid hormone. And there was a study that came out that got it so wrong. I, when I read it, I was like, I don't think they totally understand how thyroid works in the body because what they said is, oh, birth control actually makes higher levels of thyroid hormone and it, like, it may be helpful. And there, I've had people that are like, that come in with this study all the time and they're like, no, this study says that it may be helpful. And I'm like, I get that they said that, but why did they say that? Because total 
thyroid hormone was elevated. Total thyroid hormone went up while you were on birth control. Why? Because we bound all your free hormone. You can't use that. So who cares how high that like total T4 is and that total T3? You're not using it. I mean, like I want to say lab testing is very important. So I'm not saying don't test it. Definitely test it. So, you know, the other issue is that even if it is a bioavailable, when it gets to the cell receptor site, if you are deficient in the nutrients that birth control, the pill specifically, can cause deficiencies in, you won't actually accept it at the cellular level. Now, one more layer in all of this. The pill specifically is inflammatory, but as it's turning out, it's looking like almost all of birth control is inflammatory. But the best research we have is on the pill. And understand, everybody, that's, that's the first thing we ever had step on the scene. That's why we've got so much more research on it. But with that, they've measured women's blood for C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation. Everybody should have this tested before they start birth control. And then women went on birth control. They went on the pill. CRP goes up. Inflammation's up. Now, what happens when we're inflamed? We all recognize insulin resistance is a thing. that We can't actually dock insulin on the cell. No hormone is different from insulin in terms of its ability to dock on the cell in the face of inflammation, which means that your labs... Let's say nothing happened. You're, you're taking a multivitamin prenatal. None of this stuff I've talked about so far has taken place in your body. Like your body's compensating well because your body can do that. So your thyroid labs look normal, but your hair's falling out and your skin's dry and you can't poop and your feet hurt so bad the second they touch the floor and your voice is becoming deep and gravelly now. And like all of these like little subtle ways. Now you're gaining weight. You're feeling depressed. I don't know. Is it birth control or is it my thyroid? And that's where things can get confusing and your labs look normal. Well, it may be that you're actually experiencing inflammation and we've got cellular resistance. And at this time in medicine, we don't have a great way to evaluate. Is that what is going on in terms of your hypothyroid symptoms? Mm. Wow. We didn't even talk about Hashimoto's gut health and how birth control causes intestinal hyperpermeability and may set the stage for autoimmunity. <laughs> we didn't even go into that yet. You guys, it's all in the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's my question. Do you feel that women who have taken the pill for an extended period of time, are they more likely then to end up with thyroid issues later on? Or an autoimmune disease. Or right? an autoimmune yeah. Yeah. Well, we do know that certain autoimmune diseases are correlated with hormonal birth control use. Um, so how do we develop autoimmune disease? Dr. Fasano defined this, not me. There's lots of research um, on this for people who are like, but my gastroenterologist says that leaky gut syndrome is not real. Well, look up intestinal hyperpermeability in PubMed and they should probably read a study because it's real and it exists. So there's really three ingredients and I talk about this in the book. Um, and one is genetic susceptibility. Uh, this is our current understanding for everyone listening. Uh, intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut, the pill specifically can lead to that. There's NSAIDs can lead to that. So now you're on the pill, you got painful cramps still, you're taking NSAIDs, like that's a double whammy for you. And then a triggering event. Now, as we know, hormonal fluctuations are triggering events. When do we see women getting autoimmune disease? Postpartum, getting pregnant, having a miscarriage, perimenopause, postmenopause, getting your period for the first time. And birth control could very well be a part of that as well because you are taking a high enough dose of hormones that shuts down brain ovarian communication. So it is something that birth control may very well. We haven't seen research that shows directly with Hashimoto's, but we have seen re research with like interstitial cystitis. Crohn's disease is huge. Um, so with Crohn's disease, there was a study out of Harvard five years or more on the pill with a family history of Crohn's disease, and you got a 300% increased risk of developing that. And so these are the kinds of things I talk about the different autoimmune conditions in uh, my book and how birth control can contribute to those. Autoimmunity, like just about everything, is multifactorial. And so I don't want people to misunderstand me and think that it's just birth control. So if I just remove birth control and that's the one thing I do, things will get better. Birth control may have been just another drop in the bucket along with environmental toxins, uh, genetic susceptibility, foods that you were eating, like so many different things. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's not one thing, it's everything. Yeah. But just wondering if that w could be one of the things and yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, so if not the pill, then what? What's your recommendation for birth control? Yeah, well, again, every form of birth control is really, it has to be considered for the individual. And there is no one size fits all. Now, in chapter 13 of my book, I go through the non-hormonal birth control options. 
It's really funny because I had um, someone sent me a message and they're like, I'm really disappointed that you didn't go through all of the hormonal birth control options. And like, I actually say like hormonal birth control, see chapters one through 12, like (laughs) go look at all of that. Um, Because some women have misunderstood that they're like, well, you say the pill, but hey, anytime I'm talking about progestin issues, which is the synthetic progesterone, it applies to all hormonal birth control. So I don't want to vilify uh, hormonal birth control. If you feel like that's the best for you, see the book, see the ways to support yourself, see how to communicate with your doctor. But if it's not what you feel is best for you, and you know maybe you're having mood symptoms, there's other formulations you can try of the pill, by the way. Sometimes we think like, the old, like oh, the pill just doesn't work. Well, there's lots of different pills. Um, and in that, you know, the options that we have for non-hormonal birth control, we've got one IUD. It's the copper IUD. Works for some, not for everyone. You heavy, painful periods, endometriosis, shut it down. You don't even want to touch it. Um, and, you know, it's anytime you have a medical intervention, I also recommend getting some baseline lab testing and tracking your symptoms. So with the copper IUD, there is the very pre- preliminary evidence uh, to suggest that, that copper may very well become systemic. And that can lead to zinc issues, thyroid issues, other things. So how do you know if it's true? Um, you test and you monitor yourself because it's not going to be the same for every woman. We also have barrier methods, condoms, cervical cam, um, diaphragms are a little harder to come by these years. And quite honestly, condom with perfect use is going to do better than a cervical cap in terms of, you know, pregnancy risk. And that's really what we have to look at too. What side effects are you okay with? Like, and what's your family history? And as I talk about um, in the reversing metabolic mayhem chapter, like, do you have genetic predisposition to having issues with birth control? And if you are someone who's like, I can't get pregnant at any cost, um, you know, it may very well be that like an IUD is a better option for you than something like fertility awareness method coupled with condoms. Now, I do love fertility awareness method for the data that women can collect in their body. Um, It can be a great way to prevent pregnancy for some women. And I think if you're going to do this method, getting with a fertility awareness educator is one of the best things that you can Mm -hmm. do. And if you do want to use um, an app or something like Natural Cycles or Daisy, please don't think you can just trust an app or a thermometer over your body. And that's where we get ourselves in big trouble is where we're like, I'm just going to take a backseat to my fertility. This pill is working. Well, maybe it is like, you know, there's a perfect use and a typical use and it's not as effective as we are told because we don't take it that way. So we have to be very uh, cognizant that if we don't want to get pregnant, even if you're using hormonal birth control or or you're not hormonal birth control, you still have to be on top of your game with that. And, um, you know, outside of that, uh, you know, there, there's not a lot of options that we have. There's um, new uh, gels. Um, So there are gels out there and new gels being developed that actually will change the cervical mucus so that it basically isn't the super highway when fertile cervical mucus hits, it's like a super highway that gets sperm uh, to the egg immediately. It's like, go. Uh, It's not immediate just for the people who like to be really, really factual. But you can actually alter it with these gels. And so we are starting to see iterations. And why are we seeing these iterations? This is very important to understand. It's not because medicine's like, oh, we really should come up with something better. It's because consumers, women, especially millennials and younger, are saying, we want other options and the market, it's, it's a money decision. The market is saying, I'm not going to keep buying what you have here. I need a new version. It's like, you know, and it's like, uh, I've been drinking like grape juice and I'm over it. Like what else you got for me? Kind of situation. <laughs> Manufacturers like, would you like to try pomegranate juice? Like right. instead, <laughs> that kind right. of thing. And so to recognize that a lot of, uh, a lot of this, you know, for a long time, I was in my twenties naively under, um, <laughs> <laughs> like just all the things in my 20s. Um, <laughs> but naively under the impression that, you know, medicines and these things were developed because they like primarily wanted to help people. And I'm not saying that they don't want to help people and that these things don't serve to help people. But as it turns out, it's a business decision. And so it's more about like why, you know, I've had women who read about the male hormonal birth control option and how, you know, I talk about how I'm not necessarily advocating that we just like come out with this and start medicating men and see what happens. Um, And women are like, well, 
you know, why not? And like, why aren't we pushing for this more? And why would the pharmaceutical company not give this to us? And it's because men aren't going to take it. Mm-hmm. Like, and so it's a business decision. And mm-hmm. so we can get a little less upset when we understand that the pharmaceutical industry cannot dump millions, if not billions of dollars into drug development if there is no one out there that's going to buy it. And so that's, that's the reality. Um, I'm all for general uh, or gender equality and, uh, you know, uh, genders being, you know, men and and men want options too, other than condoms. So like, I'm all for like putting the options out there, but I don't think it's um, fair. And I just want to like really caution people to say this burden has been on women forever. Okay. Just switch. Let's just medicate it, put it all, medicate men and put it all on men. I don't think that's necessarily the answer. Options, that's the answer. And for each individual to meet with their doctor and get that informed consent to make the best decision for themselves. I love that. And I think it's such an important point to remember that, you know, consumers drive the marketplace, right? Um, Now, I wanted to ask you before we have to sign off a little bit about postpartum hypothyroidism, because I know that doesn't have a whole lot to do with birth control, right? Maybe a lack of birth control, but that's what I had. And, and since we've got you on the line, I was wondering if you could talk to us briefly about pregnancy as a trigger for thyroid issues. Like looking back, I wonder, was, were there things I could have done in pregnancy that might have mm-hmm. changed the outcome for me? Because I'm one of those people that it has been, uh, it didn't resolve, you know, shortly after um, postpartum, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably a lifelong thing for me, Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism. So yeah. Well, yeah. and that's true for me as well. That's how I developed um, uh, uh, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism was postpartum thyroiditis. And so my first book, Healing Your Body Naturally After Childbirth, is all about, um, it's called The New Mom's Guide to Navigating the Fourth Trimester. It's all about what happens in those three months that follows birth that can really set the stage for your health as a mom. And when it comes to postpartum thyroiditis, um, to me, it's silly that it has a different name. Now, why it has a different name is because it's considered a transient autoimmunity. You guys, all autoimmunity is transient. Like, I just want people to understand that. Antibodies can go up and down. Um, and, and you can have antibodies, one lab test, and then it can go completely in remission and you don't see it again. And so... Why I say, and like, and look, if you are someone who's more end stage autoimmunity, that's not as transient as what I'm talking about with that is like when antibodies show up. And it is regarded that there's a certain percentage of women who will spontaneously recover their thyroid health and put it back into remission around 12 months postpartum. The trouble is, is that half of those women, if they go on to have another baby, are going to have have it come back and it's likely going to be permanent. So does that mean that postpartum thyroiditis is just this one and done, like once you get to 12 months, it's over? It's kind of like nausea in pregnancy where you're like, oh, if I can just get to this point, and then you're like, wait, but it's that week and I still am nauseous. Yeah, that's how nature is. Um, (laughs) So... With postpartum thyroiditis, we see as high as one in 12 women worldwide will develop this. And there are things that we can do in pregnancy that I've uncovered through the research and I've done with a lot of patients to be able to optimize our health postpartum and avoid a thyroid flare, especially because I work with a lot of women who have Hashimoto's through pregnancy and we want to avoid it postpartum. So in pregnancy, let's talk about what happens. So we're going to oversimplify the immune system so everyone can understand this. We've got two aspects here, Th1 and Th2. Th1 is viruses, bacteria, um, and autoimmunity in most cases. Now, Th2, that's more about allergies, um, eczema, and really should have been for parasites, but we don't get as many of those as we used to. Now, being pregnant, your immune system would actually terminate that pregnancy if TH1 was turned on and recognizing non-self. So that's what your immune system does. It says, is this me? Is it not me? If it's not me, get rid of it. Like, and um, with that, baby's not you. Baby's genetically, um, you know, enough dissimilar that your immune system would attack and that would be a miscarriage and that would be awful. So your body being really smart actually switches TH2 to come on and be higher activity. TH1 comes down a bit. And that's why moms are also told like, don't be around people who are sick um, or, you know, it's, it's harder to recover because of the immune system shift. And this is all a beautiful, beautiful mechanism. Now, during pregnancy, we definitely want to be on a prenatal, but 
that's not all. Like we want to be eating in a way, now first trimester, all bets are off. But other than that, <laughs> eating in a way that supports our gut health, you know, considering taking probiotics, um, you know, getting omega-3 fatty acids, monitoring our vitamin D and supplementing with that. So those are two really important, the omega-3s and the vitamin D and the um, little critters that grow in your gut are really important for optimizing TH1 and TH2 in a non-pregnant person so that when you you know give birth that that TH1 TH2 can be a little better balanced now in your third trimester, it's been interesting. There's research where, and I do this with every woman about um, 36 weeks is about when I want to run this test. And I'm going to look at a full thyroid panel, antibodies, homocysteine, uh, CRP, and start collecting this data to try to be predictive of what might happen. We know if there are antibodies present, and those antibodies shouldn't be there, um, in your third trimester, it's pretty good odds you're going to have a postpartum thyroid flare. And so if you know that's coming, then you can have a game plan ready to go when you're postpartum. And so I also think it's really um, important to you know advocate for yourself to get this lab testing. Vitamin D is another really important one to be looking at as well. And then once you have baby, what happens? Well, your hormones drop almost to like a uh, postmenopausal woman. And those hormones, again, that fluctuation in hormones can be a trigger for autoimmunity, but also your estrogen. Everybody likes to be like, estrogen dominance, estrogen is the devil. No, no, hold on. Your estrogen can actually help with immune system modulation, as can testosterone. No one talks about that enough. So when you're on birth control and you don't have your testosterone because it's all bound up, that can actually lend itself to inflammation as well, and you can become inflamed. So to understand that once you have baby, I typically like to test six to eight weeks, um, depending on what's going on. If those antibodies weren't present in um, the third trimester, I may be like, okay, girl, let's just get you to three months because <laughs> you're going to be busy enough with a new baby. But if we can catch it early enough, we can definitely intervene. You know, the time that we see hypothyroidism most pronounced is the same time that we see postpartum depression gets diagnosed. And something that I have seen and in, in, in my clinical experience have found is if a woman goes to her gynecologist, her ob or a primary care physician with um, like feeling postpartum depression, she's more likely to get the psych medication. If she goes to a psychiatrist, these are the, these are the MDs who are experts in mental health, more likely to get that thyroid test first, which wow. is like something that's like a, a mismatch in that. And so I wow. always advocate that my patients establish with a psychiatrist um, while she's pregnant. And I'm not saying that like everyone's going to need a psychiatrist, but if you do, you don't want to be in like the depths of depression trying to find someone to help you. So it's always better to establish and build a team and then use them as you need them. Always ha already have that rapport and that relationship rather than, um, you know, last minute just trying to get in with somebody because you're so desperate. And I think we've all been there. So I want to say a caveat to pregnancy is hyperthyroidism which is t typically TH2, that tends to come on in pregnancy. Whereas a lot of people, a lot of women with Hashimoto's actually feel better while they're pregnant because of what's happening with the immune system. So briefly what you can do postpartum, check your vitamin D, supplement appropriately. Vitamin D is absolutely necessary and a must in immune system modulation. And mama, you need to have adequate vitamin D so that your baby gets adequate vitamin D from you. Making sure that you are sleeping when you can and get help. Oh my God, if I ever have another baby, which I'm probably not going to, I would have a postpartum doula. Like forget, forget all the plans we make around birthing. Like that was one of the things why I wrote my book because we make all these plans to birth and I hate to break it to you if you never had a baby, but all bets are off when you step up to that birth door. Like I had all these plans and I'm into vomiting and crawling around on all fours for like 24 hours. Like that's not the way I saw it going down, but that's the way it went down. And then I realized that I had made all these freezer meals. I had three months. I'm, I'm like, I call myself an ant, like the insect, because that's how I roll. I'm always like, let's store for the winter. Um, <laughs> and I had three months worth of meals, but I'm like, I needed a lot more support. And I look at that and I look at the lack of sleep and the stress. You want to drive like the seek and destroy. Like it's a TH17. I always hear Metallica going of like this, these cells go out and they're just like, rip it apart, destroy right. everything, stop sleeping and start stressing. What does a new baby do to you? <laughs> Just those things. Yeah. 
them vitamin D, probiotics, fish oil, stay with your prenatals, like for as long as you're nursing and perhaps even longer and talk with your doctor about that. Get lab testing. The second you feel like something's not right, you find someone to test those labs. I went through this myself. I lost more than a year of my life with my son not being diagnosed, being dismissed. You guys, I am a doctor and doctors dismiss me telling me I was a new mom. I was tired and there were times where I was told things were in my head. And I finally was like, I'm getting this dang panel done. Like I'm just ordering this myself. And there it was, there it was. And I'm like, how long I had struggled because like people weren't willing to run the lab test. So advocate for yourself, get the lab testing done. You don't want to be guessing at what you're dealing with. And just because we're talking about postpartum thyroiditis doesn't mean that's what you have. Like it could be adrenal issues. It can be gut issues. It can be other things. And so You've got to find that healthcare provider to couple with. And if you do need support, like uh, in the fourth trimester, you can pick up my first book. I take you through, a lot of it is, I, I'm going to come out with a new version of that book when I get some time. Because a lot of it is like how I roll, which is like making my own teas and everything. And I've had women that are like, I love that you have these adaptogenic blends and all this stuff and they, they'll do it. And then there's others that are like, can't you just like give me a pill to take? And I'm, like, and I'm like, I hear that. you like, I mean, I have, I have patients with like, I have patients with like eight kids. I have patients with like 20 something kids um, that have a lot of kids. And I'm like, I have one. And I know what some days are like for me. So if you have more than one, I am like, I, I hear you with just wanting a pill, which is why we came out with the Dr. Brighton line. It was after so many requests of people being like, yeah, 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 you're giving me the DIY. Yeah, 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 you're giving me the food, but I like need supplements I can trust. And so that's really, I mean, again, it's about, you know, people asking and me being like, oh, okay, this is something you're interested in. So I know I just did a fire hydrant move with all that information because we were coming up on time and I'm like, we could have a whole interview on just that. Um, is there anything else we should talk about? <laughs> Well, wow. and thank you for sharing that. No, yeah. such great information and, and advice. Um, just what's your main takeaway for the listeners today? Advocate for yourself and know that you know what is normal for you. There is a really well-documented phenomenon known as gaslighting, and it happens to women more than it happens to men. And because of our stories being dismissed and us being ignored, we die of heart attacks at a higher rate. We die of strokes at a higher rate. Our sisters are dying because they're being dismissed. And so what I want to say to every woman out there is you know you're normal. And if it is not normal for you, you need to find someone who will listen. You need to advocate for yourself because the reality is, is that your doctor may be an awesome doctor, but that not for what you need. And that doesn't make them a bad person and it doesn't make you a liar. Okay. Like we can just find somebody else to partner with, to get the health help they need. And you do not need to go it alone. Okay. This is the age of DIY everywhere. DIY thyroid care is you're not going to be satisfied with the outcome. So make sure that you're partnering with people because there are incredible clinicians out there who are ready and willing to support you on your journey. And remember, what you do every day makes a difference. So having personal responsibility in that partnership can take you so far. Mm. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I also want to share with the listeners that you have an amazing freebie for them, the post-birth control syndrome quick start detox guide. And we'll put this in the show notes on thyroid refresh guys, but you can find it at drbrighton.com slash PBCS diet. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out it's B-R-I-G-H-T-E-N. Yeah. <laughs> um, I misspelled it like five years ago on Twitter and, and you replied to me and I was like so starstruck and I couldn't even, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I misspelled your name. I'm sure you don't remember. But <laughs> You know what? Don't even worry about it. And it's really funny because the other day I was typing in a hurry and I misspelled my first name to someone and they were like, I thought you're your, it was E-N-E, -E, not E-E-N. I'm like, no, you're, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I just messed it up. Like, oh, that makes me uh, feel so much better. Thank oh, you. Totally. <laughs> Like my name is just full of so many E's. I'm like, just put them in there somewhere. Just throw some in there. I'm the same way. I got a couple A's, a couple N's. If you just put them all in there, we'll be good, well, right? And I called you Dana for like ever. Or no, Dana. Dana I called you right. Dana forever. Right. Right. I know. Yeah. I know. And that's the, that's the thing that I think um, it's uh, like, it's the thing uh, where so many of us can just be like, it's okay. It's not worth getting upset over. Like mm -hmm. I get people who are like, I get so upset when people don't say my name right. And I'm like, 
but how do they know? At least they tried. Right. Like, right. Hey, you, because I don't know how to say it. Right. <laughs> also, it. if the listeners want to order this book, Beyond the Pill, let me tell you, you definitely want to do so at beyondthepillbook.com. Because when you do, the book comes with like $250 in bonuses. There's recipe guides, shopping lists, supplement guides, a ton of stuff, guys. So again, we'll put all of this in the show notes on Thyroid Refresh. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Brighton. And for our listeners, you can find Dr. Jolene Brighton at www.drbrighton.com. Um, thanks for joining us for another episode of Thyroid Refresh TV, where we give you the inspiration and information you need to live thyroid healthy. To receive your free Thyroid Thrivers Grocery Guide, you can visit us at thyroidrefresh.com. And to learn more about Thyroid 30, our revolutionary 30-day wellness adventure, go to thyroidrefresh.com slash thyroid30. You do have the power to heal, and we have the tools. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to help us continue inspiring and empowering thyroid patients worldwide, please leave us a review on iTunes. It would make our day. You are what makes this community the amazing resource that it is. And we so appreciate your listenership and your support. We're Dana and Jenny wishing you the best of health. See you next time, guys. Thanks. See you next time. Mm-hmm.